Introducing The Vixen Voice, a podcast for ambitious women entrepreneurs ready to move into their feminine essence, live their truth, and unlock their full potential. I'm your host, April Roberts, and each week I'll be interviewing inspiring women who decided to take a leap of faith to pursue their dream. Women who believe that they were born for something bigger. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of The Vixen Voice. Today, I have Marilee Bramall on with me. And ladies, be prepared to be jealous because guess what Marilee does? She works in the wine industry. In fact, she's the founder of Iola Wines and the Iola Wine Society. And we're going to get into what each of those are as she shares her story with you. But today is going to be a fun episode because we're basically going to talk about wine, wisdom, and business. I mean, three of my favorite things. So Marilee, welcome. Thank you so much, April. It's great to be here. I love it. So we were chatting before we came online about the maps above you. I'm a, I'm a super fan of maps. And I'm just going to tell the audience I might ruffle some feathers, but I'm a huge fan of old world wine. So I love that you've worked in the California, Washington industries, and also you became a specialist in French and Italian wine. So I'm super excited to chat. And I have to tell you, I'm probably going to pick your brain because I'm going to be in France and Italy in October. So I definitely do. will need tips. Please do. <laughs> cool. Well, it is your first time to the Vixen Voice, and I know you've heard some of our episodes and you're familiar. Uh -huh. And so what I would love to start with is, you know, I just like to share with everyone, you were recommended to me by a connection we had in common and they raved about you. And when I heard what you did and I read your story in your website, I thought, absolutely, I would love to interview Marilee. So I always like to share why I wanted to have you on, but I'd love for you to share your story. Obviously, you know, I like to say we women are very multifaceted. We're all our own gemstones. So we have this beautiful, amazing woman with this kick-ass business that you're building. And, you know, if we think back, what is maybe a pivotal story? I'm sure you've had many as most of us have, but what sticks out into your in your mind, a pivotal moment that really helped shape the woman you are today? Oh, my goodness. A pivotal moment that helped shape the woman I am today. I mean, I would say that for me, what happens is I have a series of those regularly when I work, I when it. I meet with the producers that I work with in France and Italy. Each of these women has an incredible story. And it's, you know, it's really just what you said. It's there, you know, we're multifaceted gemstones and that's what these women are. Each one of them is extraordinary in her own way. So when I get to spend time with them and, you know, I spend a lot of time with them and I generally, it's sort of like an interview. I record, audio record, you know, for like a whole day. So I have a lot of material that I used to write about them and about their wines. But just the chance, when I go back and re-listen to these women and I'm re-immersed in their stories, every time, you know, there are so many stories that I could tell you about them right now, but each of them has an impact and an influence on me and, and mm -hmm. I, you know, makes me think a lot about, you know, who I want to be. The other example I have to give is my grandmother, Iola, who I named the company after. She's the one that I was lucky to have her in my life for a really long time. And she is the person that taught me from the beginning how important gratitude is and to yeah. have a gratitude practice and to celebrate as many moments in life as you can. Don't wait for the big things. Look for something mm -hmm. every day to celebrate. How, I mean, she was someone that just loved people. She loved everyone and she showed her love in a lot of ways, whether it was, I mean, she was an artist, she was a pianist, she was an incredible cook. And I mean, this is a woman actually that, you know, she grew up during the depression mm -hmm. and, you know, figured out how to go from a really difficult childhood into being this person that just emanated love and joy and inclusion and sisterhood. You know, she was kind of ahead of her time in that way in terms yeah. of 
embracing this sisterhood, whether she was one of seven sisters. So I have a big family of women. I mean, one of my uncles says that we are definitely a matriarchal family. But yeah, my grandmother Iola was, she's the one that showed me who I want to be in the world. Hey there, just popping in quickly. It's April Roberts. And I wanted to thank you for being a loyal listener of the Vixen Voice. It means so much to me. And because of that, we're going to be popping in these little announcements because I want you to be the first to know what's going on at the Vixen Gathering. So if you haven't done so yet, click the link below and check out the Vixen Founders Collective. The members who are already in are raving and we would love to have you join us and the ultimate business consulting, networking, and personal growth community for Gen X female founders. See you there. That's beautiful. And thank you for sharing. I was curious where the name came from and there you've shared it with us. I love her name. I always thought if I, uh, one of the names I had, if I had uh, children was to name my daughter Iris. I love that name for oh, some reason. And Iola is so beautiful. similar. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Well, let's dig in. So Marilee, how does one go about getting involved in the wine industry? I know your story on your website shared you remember your first sip of wine, which was a Bordeaux that your father gave you, right? So tell us a little bit about your journey. Okay, so like all of us, it's a bit circuitous. Yes. But yes, that first sip of wine, I had an interesting introduction to wine. It was really kind of, you know, oddly more of the way that it happens in Europe, not so much the way it happens in America. Mm -hmm. I was about 10 or 11 years old and my yep. dad made a gorgeous dinner and he, my dad is someone, I mean, I adore my dad. He's one of my biggest fans and he's, you know, always cheering me on with what I'm doing with Iola and he's been a, a wine enthusiast his whole life. He's never studied mm -hmm. wine, but he's always appreciated it. It's always been you know around and that day he was you know he's a Bordeaux guy he loves Cabernet Sauvignon and he was pouring his favorite left bank Bordeaux and for some reason he decided I could have just a tiny 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 taste and I never forgot it and it wasn't that oh my palate was so developed it was more about what it meant and it what it mm. meant was food it meant family i knew it was from this place far away france a place i dreamed of going and mm. that planted the seed for me and you know fast forward i did end up living in france for a while during my university time learned the language which i always say i'll be studying french and wine the rest of my life because both of them are complicated and kind of endless in terms of learning. <laughs> and so when I came home from France, I ended up kind of just fell into a job in the wine business here in the U.S. in in Washington State and ended up kind of in, swallowed up in the corporate machine of the wine world, working for a, a big, a big wine company that owns several different brands in Napa as well as in Washington State. And that was an incredible experience for me in a couple mm -hmm. ways. One, I had the opportunity to taste a lot of wonderful wine. Wine from Washington, wine from, from California, really some incredible experiences. Met wonderful people, really fell in love with Napa. I thought that I would end up living there eventually. I was working hard to make that happen. Never happened. There was a different path for me, clearly. The other thing that happened during that time was that is when on a kind of on a subconscious level, I first started to notice how few women there were making mm -hmm. wine and how often in the company I worked for, women were going after those, those jobs as winemakers or enologists and they didn't get the jobs. There was always a reason why they weren't hired. And these are women that worked inside the company. They didn't get the jobs. We, instead, what would happen is we, a man from outside the company would be hired. And so, and then I noticed, you know, that we only had one woman in, in our senior leadership. And it took time for all of this to settle in. And then, you know, once it settled in and raised to my conscious level, mm -hmm. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And that was, you know, that was a big part of what got me on the path that I'm on right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it was about 2008 is when I got real curious about the old world. You know, <laughs> we've all had some, well, most of us have had some amazing wines from, well, from the U.S. I mean, there's so much wine yeah. being made in the U.S. now. My primary experience was the West Coast of the U.S. Some amazing wine. But 
at the end of the day, I knew that Cabernet Sauvignon was not native to the Napa Valley. So I wanted to know the origin story. Like, where did this grape come from? What is its story? What would happen if I went into the native terroir and experienced the wine when the grape has grown in the place where it first appeared on the planet? So, yeah, that's that was, you know, 2008. And then I, you know, I kind of got swallowed up in the wine geek world and started studying in what I would call more scholarly kind of way yeah. and certifications. And then eventually that led to starting importing wine in 2017. And I've right. always worked with women producers that are making organic and sustainable yep. and biodynamic wines in France and Italy. I love it. So when you got curious in 2008, is that when you moved to France for some time? No, actually, when I lived in France, I was in college. So yeah, oh, it was before okay. that. Yeah, so, I was living there right before I went to work in the wine business here in the U.S. And when I started that job in the U.S., I really hoped that what would happen is that my language skills and mm -hmm. my, you know, the, the experience in the wine business that I just, you know, the job I just accepted. I really hope those two things would intersect. And yeah. that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Yeah. That's interesting. So, so I had you to go find it myself. Yeah. And you created it. I love that. So we're going to dig into wine info quickly because you mentioned the left and the right bank. So I, when I lived yeah. in Houston, I was part, just a girlfriend put together a wine club and we would get together cool. once a month. And I remember the first time we had to present something about our wine. And so I taught about the left and the right bank. And I was like fascinated. I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Like who knew all of this, right? We're just yeah. drinking wine. So share with us like the, and, and honestly, it escapes me now the distinctions, but there's, there's a distinction just like in the past, you know, true bourbon had to come from Kentucky. That's not the case right. anymore, right? So we've expanded beyond on, but I, I mean, I know the French are very specific about their wines and the Italians are very specific about their wines. So share with us the difference between the left and the right bank wines. Oh, yay. Yes. Cool. It would be a pleasure to do that. <laughs> so, you know, you, you just you just said something really, really important, which is the French and the Italians are very, very specific about their wines. I love to talk to people about this. I mean, France is a perfect example about how mm -hmm. specific they are with their wines because of the fact that when you buy a bottle of French wine, you don't typically see the name of the grape on the label. And that's what throws people a lot. You know, they see a, bo a bottle of Bordeaux. Some, this is from Bordeaux. I don't, but what, what is that a place? Are those grapes? Mm. What does that mean? So for me, this is foundational about wine. Above all, wine is about a sense of place. Mm -hmm. And that is why in France, when you buy a bottle of wine, it's called Bordeaux or it's called Burgundy or a specific place in Burgundy. It's called Chablis because these are all places. So if mm -hmm. you know those places, those places have grapes that are grown there. And their reason is because they have, they've got a, a book of rules for each, you know, each appellation about what grapes can be grown there in order to put that, you know, in order to put Bordeaux on the label or Burgundy on the label, or Bourgogne as we should be saying. So the left and right bank of Bordeaux, to boil it down, there's a couple things that are really important to know about each. Left bank, you're really thinking about Cabernet Sauvignon. Cabernet Sauvignon mm -hmm. is a grape that, you know, Bordeaux, it has more of a maritime climate, It's so it's a cooler climate. And Cabernet Sauvignon is a grape that needs more, uh, it takes longer to ripen. It needs a bit mm -hmm. of help to ripen. So the reason it does so well on the left bank is because the soils are more heat retentive. We've got the gravelly soils on the left mm -hmm. bank and those, you know, the, those gravelly soils retain, uh, they drain really well and they retain the heat. You know, the gravel warms up, retains the heat that reflects back up to the vine and helps to ripen. The right bank is a different, so, so left bank, the dominant grape that we find in the blend is Cabernet Sauvignon. So I should say yep. Bordeaux is about a blend. Mm -hmm. It's, it's pretty, you're not going to find single varietal wines too much there. Really, we're talking about a blend in the major grapes there, are Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merle, you see some Petit Verdot also. Malbec used to be very important grape there in the blend, although uh, a freeze in 1955 wiped out a lot of that, and we've seen a lot of Merlot instead. So Malbec, interestingly, is, is native to France. Most people don't know that. 
So, so the blend is important, absolutely. And Cabernet Sauvignon is the dominant grape in the blend for left bank. Now, if we cross over to the right bank, what we have mm -hmm. are different soils. We tend to have more clay and limestone soils, and those soils are cooler. And this is so important because the grape that's dominant on the right bank is Merlot. And Merlot, you know, it's gotten such a bum rap. I feel, you know, I know. I'm, I'm somewhat, you know, because of that movie Sideways years ago, yeah. Merlot really, I mean, they really railed on Merlot in that movie. And, and it, you know, kind of took a, a digger afterwards. And, you know, there's a lot of people, I think, in the U.S., and I certainly used to be one of them that, you know, was just not a fan of Merlot. And it was because I hadn't had Merlot from where it's originally from. So right. both Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot are native to Bordeaux. And Merlot is a grape that likes to have cold feet. So those clay limestone soils are cooler soils. And that's where you get the beautiful, elegant powerful expressions of Merlot. Mm -hmm. So on the right bank, you tend to have Merlot more dominant in the blend. You still have Cabernet Franc and some Cabernet Sauvignon, depending upon where you're at on the right bank. And then, you know, of course, on the left bank, Cabernet Sauvignon is dominant. You will have some Merlot probably in the blend and some Cabernet Franc, maybe some Petit Verdot. Kind of depends on what people are growing. But the difference is to think about the soils yeah, and what the grape needs. Yeah. Merlot doesn't need the, that heat to ripen. It likes to have its feet cold in those clay limestone soils. And that's when you get the, like I said, the beautiful, elegant expression of Merlot. And it's become, I mean, for me, once I, once I was in France and tasted it, and I was like, wait a minute, this is Merlot? Okay, I love <laughs> exactly. Merlot. This is incredible. And, you know, so the great appellation on the right bank, saint Million, is, you know, we've it's hard to top and and it's it's really special when you get to experience those wines and for me this is the example of i wanted to go to the source i wanted to go see mm. what would happen what would it be like to taste the wine when the grape is living in its native terroir how does it express itself I love it. So I had a lovely Cab Franc last night. My neighbors always take mm. care of things for me when I'm out of town. They're so great. So I treated them out for wine and appetizers last night. And I had a great Cab Franc. I love a good Cab Franc. Thank you so me much too. for sharing that. I do. Yeah, it's so I, I just really yeah. I'm so happy when I find that. So I, I do have to say being in my I mean, I've always loved wine and I kind of I lived in Italy for some time. My ex-husband was Italian, so we lived in Milan. But okay. I mean, we had the wine experience. Mm -hmm. and, really? and I just always have leaned intuitively to which wine I want to drink from the description or the label. Like, I like the old school labels. Now, even the old school wines are leaning toward more modern labels, right? But like, mm -hmm. that's like literally how I would pick my wines. And it always served me well. But it was interesting because being in this wine club, I did start learning a lot. And then we watched Psalm and we watched Sideways and mm -hmm. like all these, you know, and I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much. And then and yeah. before I left Houston, I live in Nashville. Now I went to with a girlfriend, we went to there was a grower from Italy. And, and I know I've I, I love French wine, I love Italian, and I love some Spanish wines too. And I knew I always loved Italian wine with dinner. But I didn't realize the Italians specifically grow their wine to complement food, like by different things they put in the soil, bell peppers, etc. And I mean, all these years of having lived in Italy, loved Italian wines, I didn't understand. I was like, that's why I like a good Italian with dinner. And, you know, I love a good French wine too. But tell us a little bit more about that. Let's hop over to Italy a little bit and oh, share some yeah. knowledge with us that you, okay. you think would be interesting. <laughs> yeah, so one of my favorite things to talk about when we're talking about Italian wine is white wine. And yeah. the reason I love to talk about it is because most of us, you know, most sort of, you know, enthusiasts, people that enjoy wine, when they think of Italian wine, they're think they think of red wine. It's mm -hmm. really really easy for us to lean quickly into, oh, Italian wine, red wine, you know, we've got Tuscany's mm -hmm. full of, you know, incredible wine from Montalcino and Montepulciano, you know, the Vino Nabile de Montepulciano and then of course the whole region of Chianti. There's there's so much wonderful red wine and then, you know, of course the north. The north is incredible with red wine in, in the Longue and Piemonte. Yeah. And, you know, there's wonderful red wine in Lombardia as well. I mean, I could go on and on and on. So it's easy for us to really 
think and associate Italian wine with being red. Well, I love to talk about the white wines of Italy because they are there are so many extraordinary white wines that are age worthy. You know, a lot mm-hmm. of us think about white wine. Oh, yeah, you can have it a couple of years, and then you know it's not going to be good anymore. You got yep. it's, it's just a thing that you're going to drink immediately. It's not something that you're going to to sell or, and that it's going to evolve and age and become something new and exciting over time. Italian white wines. There is a long list of them that most of, you know, a lot, like the average wine consumer doesn't know about them. So part mm-hmm. of what brings me so much joy is exposing people to these to these grapes, to these wines, and having them experience something that's completely different. And then when you get to do a vertical tasting and you actually see how these wines can age over mm-hmm. time, it's mind-blowing. They are gorgeous food wines, absolutely. Yes. There, There's plenty that are wonderful for aperitifs. One of the things I, I loved, you know, when I was first studying Italian wines is this concept that Italians have of vino de meditazione, you know, just a meditation wine. And this is one of my favorite things to do with wine, especially Italian wines. I mean, there's like, I mean, a bunch of them coming to mind right now where if you, if you pour the wine in the glass and you're willing to hang out with that glass for an hour and just see how that wine changes over the course of that hour, how it evolves. And, you know, it's becoming, so wine is, wine is alive, it's food, and it's, it's always yeah. becoming something. So that can be over the, a long period of time if overselling. It can also be the experience over the course of an evening where you are really focused and present and, you know, meditating, as they would say, the vino de meditazione, on the wine, paying attention, being present, with what's going on in the glass. I mean, it'll blow you away. It'll blow yeah. you away. That's yeah. interesting. I think I drink mine too quickly for that, but I will try it next time. It's hard. No. I mean, it is. It's, it is. It's, it, I mean, like, it's like all of the, the things that we practice, meditation, yeah. yoga, working out, you know, eating healthy, all these things that are practices that, you know, there's no end to the journey. You just keep going. Yeah. And, you know, and wine is that way too. Yeah. No, I love the idea. And it's so funny. I mean, we could talk about Italy forever. So my other interesting thing when I live there is they have all these rules, not just about wine, but food and when you can have this and when you can have that, like they have all these digestive rules. I mean, they're very intelligent about what they're putting in their bodies and like the knowledge is passed down. And so I could totally see the wine meditation. My, I mean, my favorite thing ever, what I miss the most about Italy is aperitivo. Like, especially, oh. you know, when my husband was, a, and I go out with my girlfriends and have aperitivo. And usually we were mixed company, like we'd all go out together, but Oh my gosh, I miss aperitivo with my friends. It was just, you know, this beautiful, usually sun setting, this beautiful, magical time in Milan, and you're just enjoying your friends, like snacking and drinking wine or having a cocktail, just absolutely beautiful. I, you know, I love that you brought this up because this is, this is another thing that I love about old world wine is how much culture is embedded in you know wine is so much a part of the culture and aperitivo so much Mm -hmm. a part of the culture in france you know we call it apero and it's the same thing it's you know it's this thing that that you know it's the highlight of the day for french people because it means it's convivial they're going to be with friends you're i mean it's Mm -hmm. just like what you described you're having this beautiful moment you're snacking you know you're you're enjoying flavors you're you know you're being with your friends you're connecting and and that those things are so much a part of those two cultures and we don't really have you know and wait, wait, every once in a while we you know well let's go to happy hour but it's not the same as what you know I think what you experience with the aperitivo yeah. and and you know what I've experienced with apero and you know what I read about from a cultural perspective and talk to people about from a cultural perspective just how important you know wine is a backdrop to mm-hmm. all of that it's pre- food is a backdrop to all of that. It's about, you know, it's bringing people together. It's connection. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I've many times thought, can I start a wine bar with aperitivo here in the U S and I saw it when I was in Houston, people tried a couple of times and it just never took off and it broke my heart. Cause I was mm-hmm. like, I mean, and in Italy it's the whole bar scene, which is 
I they use the term bar differently than we do, right? Yeah. Because that's where you go have your brioche and your cappuccino in the morning. That's where you go have a salad or sandwich at lunch. And then that's where you go have a aperitivo. And then it closes. It doesn't serve dinner. And I mean, I just like have this romantic dream of owning an Italian bar where you just, because you're just talking to people all day long as you serve them food yeah. and drinks. Like, I just think yeah. that's like such a beautiful life. And you stand at the counter and have your cappuccino or cappuccio like you know you're not sitting and it's so you're so right it, you take that moment and you really just savor it and chat with whoever's next to you and it's it is so much about getting together and and that's what I love just a great meal mm -hmm. with great wine and great friends or family like there's really nothing more beautiful mm -hmm. yeah see what you just described that really encapsulates what my very first experience with wine was oh really that's yeah. that's what it meant to me what you just described all you know what like I said it wasn't that I had a, a developed palate and that I you know I loved the wine for the flavor it was the meaning and the meaning mm -hmm. is what you just described you know it's it's this time with people you're with your friends you're with your family you're in this beautiful place that you're having flavors that are you know enlivening mm -hmm. and yeah it's the moments yeah, it's part of being alive. So yeah. if you're listening to us, I hope we're inspiring you to recreate this somehow in your life because it's incredibly important. I can share, I don't normally, I would no, normally not have a glass of wine in the middle of the week, especially not the night before podcasting. Like I'm just very careful with what I do. But like I said, I really, from my heart, wanted to thank my neighbors. I know, you know, she loves wine. So it's like, oh, let's go grab wine. And we just had the best time. And they're retired and, you know, they're a retired couple. Mm -hmm. And like, we had the best time. And I was like, oh my gosh, I miss this so much yeah. because so many times yeah. in our lives, we don't take that moment just to to be and enjoy someone's company. Yep. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. And it's I mean, again, it's it's I wish that it was more a part of our culture. I know here yeah. in the U.S. I, I well, wish it was. But I feel like there's so much we tend to just be we set our lives at a faster pace and we don't have that understand that inherent understanding mm -hmm. like they do in Italy and France about, you know, there's endings, <laughs> there's yeah. endings to things that happen during the day. And then there's a, you know, you finish this and then you go to aperitivo and you're in it, like you're in a different space. You're in a different place. Yeah. Well, I also um, yeah. feel it's shifting in the U.S. now, but so much was about appearances for so long because, mm. you know, when I lived in Italy, for example, yeah. if we were at Aperitivo, I remember one night my ex-husband invited everyone to come to our place for dinner because it was down the street. And I was like, "Hun, I don't have anything for dinner. Like, we maybe have a box of pasta. He was like, oh, whatever, we'll cook the pasta. Like, they don't care. You don't have to make as much as they love food. It's more about being together than you cooking this big fancy meal. Just basically everybody yeah. was having such a good time that they wanted to go to our place and take the party there and eat whatever was in our cupboard, right? Like, it didn't yeah. matter. And, you know, yeah. I mean, I grew up in the South where you're very proud of your home and hospitality and there's a certain way you do things, right? I mean, my yeah, mom would have been yeah. horrified if someone came to our house and she didn't have something to feed them. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Things are like, it's maybe there's, it's less spontaneous here. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. Mm -hmm. These are, yeah, beautiful memories. I, I loved, I always say my Italian friends, I mean, not just these moments, but I went through some tough times there and they really were like angels. They were just there for me. So I'm happy to have this moment to honor them. So thank you. I really yeah. love it. Yeah, yeah, I'm hoping to see some of them in October. All right, so Ooh, let's talk about funny. Iola wines. I know that you saw a lack of diversity, we'll say, in the wine industry. You saw that women weren't being represented. And you know, as you were sharing your story, I, I worked at the largest law firm. I was a lawyer, litigator in Atlanta, right out of law school. And you know, 40 partners on my team and there was one female. And then systematically, all the women either were pushed out or quit before it was partnership track because the assumption was you were gonna get married and have kids. And like, yeah. that's kind of just, it's so interesting how you said it settled in your consciousness because, you know, at first, I mean, I was just like, oh, this is how it is. It's mainly men. Like, you don't really think about it. But then I was like, I, I remember when it came time, 
you know, basically the reason I left that firm was the the managing partner who interestingly, none of the other partners like. So I had a lack of respect that they would let someone lead us who they didn't even respect. Does that make sense? I was like, what are yeah. we doing here? But, you know, right. I suddenly came into a review after two years, had never had a bad review. And he was like, everything's great. Everyone has good things to say about you. But, and he just literally made something up. And I know this because the only female partner was in the room assisting the review and I saw her face drop. And you know, we women notice everything, right? And I yeah. go, she didn't know he was gonna say this. And I think he had found out I was in a relationship. So I was, it was time for me to be in the firing range, right? Yeah. Like, oh, April has a live-in boyfriend. She's not gonna be serious. And I mean, at the time I just, re I walked out the door, grabbed my best friend, said, come to the park with me. I was so shocked. I was just like, what is going on? And I don't, I don't know that I've ever shared this story. And within a week, I had another job. I was like, forget this. I'm out of here. But like, you know, not everyone has the confidence to go do that. And so, no. I mean, this was 2003, I want to say. So it's so interesting how the world was different. We were just like, okay, this is how it is until it affected you. So like, I'm so glad that you saw this and you wanted to make a difference. So, I mean, kudos to you because it, it kind of just was how things were, right? Did you feel that exactly. way? Exactly. I mean, your experience, I mean, mirrors mine. And it. Oh. The, you said some, some specific things. Like, it's like it didn't occur to us to question it. It's just how right. it was. Yeah. It's just how it was. And then, event, you know, you get to a point and you're like, wait a minute, why is it? Why mm -hmm. is it? just this way it, you know it doesn't what if it wasn't just this way what if it was different what if we you know what if there were way more women at that law firm at you know at the partnership level what if there were mm -hmm. way more women making wine global I mean right now it's 2024 and it's it's somewhere between like 15 and 20 percent the, the stat mm -hmm. last year was 15 percent of winemakers worldwide are women 15 mm -hmm. In 2024, yeah. it's just, you know, come on, we can do better. And then especially, you know, we look at in the U.S. at, at the the stats on wine purchases. It's, you mm -hmm. know, up to 80% of wine purchases are made by women. Yeah. So, I mean, we have actually a lot of power as women to, to change that 15%. Mm -hmm. You know, we're seeing more women get involved in the wine business. But what I want to do is, you know, democratize it to the point where, there's, you know, it's really, really easy for a woman to move into, mm -hmm. into the world of wine if that's what she wants to do instead of being told that she can't or, you know, being shut out or dealing with harassment. You know, the, the other half of the story for me was I had my own experience in the business here and not seeing women. But then, you know, traveling around France and Italy, traveling mm -hmm. around Fa France, I just, you, you see a lot of père et fils, father and son. And mm -hmm. I and I just started wondering, like, where are the mothers and daughters? And mm -hmm. and in Italy, you know, a lot of fratelli or even brothers. father and daughter, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where are they? And so and and it's you know now I've got the privilege of working with several father daughter duos, mm -hmm. and and you know one in particular where the father he, his health is not good, so his daughters have taken over, and mm -hmm. this man is so proud of his daughters. It was mm -hmm. it just amazing to sit with this this Italian southern Italian man doesn't speak yeah. a lick of English. He did not leave my side all day long, and just looking at him, watching him talk to his you know watching him as his daughters talked to me, just beaming, so full of pride for, you know, what has died. And, you know, so those things are, you know, inspiring moments. Those are like, okay, wow, yeah. there's, we have potential for change here. We had a long ways to go, but there's potential. Yeah, no, I love it. And I, I, I want to pick up one thing you said that women make about 80% of the purchases. And this is an old yeah. statistic from 2019. But at that point, women were making 83% of financial purchasing decisions for their household, right? And so you use the term power, and there is power. If we want to see a change, we have the power. And the companies know we have the power, we just don't use it, right? And I mean, yeah. I I feel like this is a theme in our world in general today. Like everyone's just kind of 
accepting things as they are in many levels. We won't go down all the rabbit holes, right? We'll stick to the one we're talking about. But but I love saying that because women are, you know, I laughed that it was a client service revolution con a conference I was at and it was broken out specifically on like gearing your like selling process toward women like advertising marketing because at that point it was still so male dominated like the experience which gave me permission in my financial practice so I was like well I'm going back and changing the experience because what they said is when you gear the experience to the woman the men like it too because they're taken care of better right it becomes connection based <laughs> relationship based like like not just transactional. And that's yeah. when my financial practice really blew up. And so oh, it's okay. Wow. Like if you go to the car dealership and you don't feel like this guy's talking to you appropriately, like advocate for yourself, right? I mean, yeah. you, you have the power of the purse strings and we're not realizing Absolutely. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So much of it is awareness. It is. It is mm -hmm. It's the not realizing it and, you know, raising awareness. That's And that's part of what I'm trying to do is, is yeah. you know, through this effort is just highlight what these women are doing. Their wines are incredible. Mm -hmm. They they do great work. You know, I, I it's such a privilege for me yeah. to be on this mission for wine drinkers here in the U.S. that that mm -hmm. want to experience you know, terroir focused, terroir driven, expressive wines that are made, you know, made without chemicals in the vineyard, which is, you know, it's a big deal, especially for, I hear this a lot from my women customers that are, you know, get aging and sometimes mm -hmm. wine becomes harder to drink as mm -hmm. we age, you know, you, like I hear what I hear a lot is I know if I drink wine, I'm going to be up at like two in the morning and I'm going to be up for like mm -hmm. two hours. And, you know, I, then want to talk to then talk to them about you know have you what wine are you drinking where are you buying your yes. wine you know if you're buying your wine in the grocery store I'm not surprised to hear mm -hmm. that that is super high volume conventional wine it's not it's a whole different thing when you when you're buying wine from someone who's who's making twelve thousand bottles a year thirty five thousand mm -hmm. bottles a year versus you know twenty million bottles a year it's a yeah. different thing altogether. No, I totally agree. And I, it was so funny because I was totally fine after having that glass of wine last night. So I knew it was like a good quality wine. And that's why I like this yeah. particular place because there are more artisan wines. And I discovered yeah. that difference because living in Italy and then you come back to the U.S. and you're like, hold on, this is the same wine I liked in Italy and it tastes different here because one, often we're getting the dredges of what they're doing if it's a large producer and two, they're yeah. having to put things in the wine to sustain to ship. Am I right about this? And maybe mm -hmm. I'm pinpointing the wrong thing, but it was very clear to me that the wine we were drinking was not the same wine I was drinking in Italy. So I was grateful for that yeah. and I learned early on to find the better quality wines. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, finding a good source that you trust is, mm -hmm. is a big deal. It's really important. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Well, let's pivot and talk about your source. So share with us exactly what Iola Wines is and what the Iola yeah. Wine Society is. Yeah. So Iola Wines is, it's an online wine club and bottle shop. And what we do is source and direct import all of the wines. So, so I do that personally. Mm. And, and what that means is I'm finding producers, a lot of our producers, I'm the only importer in the U S that brings their wine wow. in. They're tiny producers. Of course, they're all women powered and they all farm organically, sustainably, biodynamically. Love so it. we're getting the experience of drinking wines that really are reflective of the place where they're grown or you're, you're having that experience of, you know, sort of traveling through the glass, you know, yeah. it is, you're tasting the place, um, you know, you're tasting Gavi in Piemonte or you're tasting the hill of Pinot Noir in Lombardia that's, you know, not far from Milan in Ultra Popavese, you know, you're mm -hmm. tasting, um, the Faro DOC in Sicilia that's above uh, the Strait of Messina. And the producer mm. I work with there is, she's a very poetic woman that, that talks about the Trainian Sea and the Ionian Sea, and this is where they meet. And you have the winds of King Aeolus, and he's the keeper of dreams. And I mean, yeah. 
There's a lot of poetry. You probably experienced this living in Italy, how much, you know, there are people that are really, really poetic. I find this both in France and Italy, very clever with how they name their wines and talk about mm-hmm. their wines. Great with wordplay. Be real there. Like some of the, the, the ways that they think about things and do things and name their wines. There's wonderful wordplay. Yeah, that's Iola Wines. Is it's it's an online bottle shop, and we have four wine clubs. So the Iola Wine Society is four different wine clubs. Champagne Club. I love champagne, oh, and wow. I'm a big believer that champagne, the wine, and the region are what they are today, largely because of the innovation and the resilience of women. And wow. I keep meeting extraordinary women in Champagne. So our Champagne Club is, has been so much fun. People are loving it. And it's, I like it because it's small. It's just two shipments a year or four bottles. So a lot of people use it as an add-on to our other clubs. People like to gift that, whether it's for a retirement or, you know, weddings, promotions, graduations, things like that. And then we have a, a, a red wine club and a white wine club. You know, I didn't start with a white wine club. I actually had customers asking, you, is there any way you could make a, a club that's just all white wines? And, mm-hmm. you know, this I think is reflective of the fact that, you know, 80 plus percent of my customers are women. Mm-hmm. And as as life goes on, you know, there's there's I definitely have a, a red wine crowd. No, no, there's yeah, there's no no doubt about that. But there is really this fascinating interest in in white wine. So that's been so fun. And this year, we're about to launch our third season of the Iola Wine Society, which means we start our allocations. We do allocations four times a year, basically quarterly, September, November, February, Mm -hmm. and and May. So next month, we start our, our third season, and it's the second year of the White Wine Club. And the wines I have sourced this year for the White Wine Club are just mind blowing fabulous oh my god lots of them are italian white wines yeah. they're amazing and then our, our final club's the connoisseur club and it kind of combines all of that mm-hmm. although i love sparkling wine so there's always sparkling wine in the connoisseur club but none of it is what you get in the champagne club those champagnes are only in the champagne club they never show up in the connoisseur club Oh, I love that. I'm actually going to check out the Champagne Club because my funny story about, I mean, I love champagne too, but I just kind of, I I didn't have a broad experience with champagne to understand the distinctions. And I was in Napa for an event and, you know, it was when I was a financial advisor and some company had flown us out there for it. And now I'm forgetting one of the, one of the Psalms from the show Psalm was there and it was like, oh, come join us for champagne and oysters. And I'm like, I'm in Napa. I want red wine. Why are we having champagne? Like, I mean, just to my friend in the room who came with me, I was kind of being a brat, right? I was like, this is so weird. And then we got Uh there. Oh my gosh, I could not have been more wrong. I mean, one of the bottles of champagne we got to taste, like I think 10 or 20 bottles come to the U.S. in a year. So it was just Mm -hmm. an amazing adventure in champagne. And like the raw bar was awesome. And it's actually one of my favorite memories. And another memory came up of white wine. You're so right. It's just about the company, right? That's what makes it great is I was, my ex-boyfriend, I was at a client of his house and they had this amazing like wine collection. So while the guys went off to work for the day, even though, even though the wife, she ran the company too, she's like, oh, I'm going to stay here with April. Do you want to have lunch? And like they had a chef. And she got like a bottle of white wine. And every day she and I had a bottle of white wine for lunch. <laughs> like it was so funny. We we're Fabulous. just like, because we were just having the best conversation and enjoying our time. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, this yeah. is not normal for me, but this is totally fun. Nor was it normal for her. But it's such a great way to like really connect and share that experience. You know, we talked about mm-hmm. our whole lives and like three days. So just a totally beautiful experience. I love the. I love this. Yeah. yeah, that is that's part of what wine does. I mean, it's yeah. it's like knitting together all of these experiences. Wine's part of the fabric of those experiences. Yeah. 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 I agree. Yeah, Champagne is it's a it's a wine region I'm really passionate about because mm-hmm. You know, we haven't, as consumers, we really haven't been taught to think about champagne no. as a wine of terroir. And it is. Oh, mm-hmm. my. It is. You know, one of the things I love to do in masterclasses is have people taste 
a Chardonnay from different places in Champagne and they're experiencing different soil types and different terroir and it's like, wait a minute. And it's really fun to do that, especially with, you know, Chardonnay is one of the three grapes used in Champagne. It's native to Burgundy, which is very close to Champagne. And it's a grape that's really, really sight expressive. So it just mm-hmm. wants to tell you the story of where it came from where it lived before it became that wine so yeah and I mean the women that I work with in Champagne millions of stories I mean stories about four generations of women the first the 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 great grandmother sewed corsets she had a corset sewing business she sold corsets to the posh department stores in Paris to Samaritan and Printemps and uh, Le Bon Marché even, and they she used the money to buy vineyard land. And that is how wow. the family champagne house was built, was through this corset business. And so the woman who I work with now, for it represents the fourth generation, she still has all the books, her, her great-grandmother's books of accounting of this many corsets went to this, went to Printemps on That's this amazing. day, and this is, you know, how many francs I earned from that. I mean, it's... The history there is really, really neat. And then, yeah, I mean, tons. I can tell you tons of stories. A fabulous cool. story about a, a producer who, her in 1927, her great-great-grandfather bought a piece of property where she now, a tiny little piece of property on a hill where she now has her vineyard. And that property actually in 1840 was owned by the Madame Veuve Clicquot, Clicquot and she built a gorgeous castle there. Uh, mm-hmm. And lived there for, you know, owned it. It was in the family for a few generations, and it was a wonderful getaway place for her. And now it's where Charlotte Le Gallet lives, and our, where her champagne house is and her vineyard, all surrounded by this wall on top of a hill. And, you know, she walks in the same footsteps that the mm-hmm. Madame of Clicquot did. And one of the things I like to point out in master classes is the difference between what Veuve Clicquot is today. Mm-hmm. What it was when Veuve Clicquot, you know, she was kind of the first lady of Champagne. She kind of invented branding and she was really, uh, you know, did incredible things at a point in history where women just weren't allowed to do what she yeah. did. And what it is now, though, it's it's owned by LVMH. They're making 20 million bottles a year. And mm-hmm. then you take Charlotte, who farms organically on this hill, and it's a really difficult thing to do in Champagne, but she doesn't want chem- chemicals in the wine. And... She makes thirty to thirty five thousand bottles a year, depending upon upon the harvest. Yeah. I love it. Well, mm-hmm. I'm definitely yeah. checking out your champagne club <laughs> and I think it sounds like a great gift. So Marilee, thank you so much. This has been super fun. I knew we were gonna have a good time. I greatly appreciate. And for everyone listening, if you want to check out the wine clubs like me, all of the information will be shared in our show notes. So you can go to vixengathering.com, go to our podcast page, and there in the show notes will be all the information you need to join the clubs, learn more about Mary Lee, learn about these amazing women she's talking about. And if you haven't done so, please subscribe to the Vixen Voice email. And every week we send you two emails, Tuesday and Thursday, when new episodes come out and all the resources come immediately to your inbox. So definitely check that out. Anything else you would like to share with our audience today, Mary Lee? Well, I mean, probably the biggest news I have right now is that we just rolled out shipping to 47 states. So I'm thrilled that you want to check out (laughs) the Champagne Club because you're in Tennessee, right? Yes. So I can get shipped Yeah, we're shipping there now. (laughs) Yeah. You can. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. Yep. Yeah, but actually next allocation goes out next month and I just finished writing about all the wines and I, because I write... I write an insert for all of the each each allocation that's you know about the woman, about the region, about you know tasting notes, oh, food I pairing guidance, it. and yeah, and it's I just finished the writing for that one, so yeah, shipping next month. So join now, get in on it. I, I love it. I was going to ask you tips to learn more about wine, but if they just subscribe to the club, they get to read more about wine. So what's better than yeah. drinking wine and learning more about wine at the same time? So I think that sounds like yep. the best tip. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I have customers that text me and ask me, you know, hey, I'm having this dinner party. Can you recommend some wines? What should I, you know, what should I serve? And I'm like, okay, you know, here, what do you, what do you make? What are you cooking here? You know, these are the wines I would, I would use. And yeah, they email me and text me. And I mean, that's being with customers is a, is a great joy for me. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I love Wednesday morning or my coaching mornings where I coach my group oh. classes and there's just so much magic. Like I'm so happy by noon Wednesday. Like it's just incredible. It's it's amazing that we get to interact with women like this and be part of their lives. It's such a great gift and it's what we do for a living. So there's nothing better. So Marilee, to wrap up today, I have two more questions for you. Okay. And I do want to honor your time. One is... As you know, at the Vixen Boys, we're about tapping into our feminine energy. So you and I both Mm -hmm. shared kind of our stories of working through. And by the way, I'm not saying we're here to overthrow the men. If you know, you know, I'm a great fan of men as well. I just mean we want to play. Me too. too. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Awesome. We want to make that clear. But, you know, I do think a lot of women, I love that you found your passion and something. Again, a lot of what you do is about connection and community and and Mother Earth. And these are very feminine energies, right? And so we get to tap into them. So my question for you is, when do you feel the most feminine? When do you feel that energy coursing through you? Wow. I mean, it just shows up so often for me. And Mm -hmm. it's really easy for me to lean into that. I think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm probably more wired that way. So, I mean, the the challenge for me is trying to straddle the world and try and trying to figure out how to get, have one foot in, into more male energy, which is not, you know, that's, doesn't come naturally to me. I'm much more wired to, you know, community and connection and togetherness. And I mean, that's what the Iola Wine Society about is about. It's about a community of people that love. I mean, it's so fun when we have a member events, we just had a champagne producer come a few weeks ago and I had a big party for our members and to see them all like exchanging phone numbers and making plans and getting together and like, I mean, and it's all over wine. So, so I don't know, maybe that's when it is, is when I get to get all of our members together, especially when, when, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a producer come from France or Italy and, and, you know, they're meeting that person and I'm just the conduit, you know, I'm just the link between, yeah, you know, that's, that's, all. and it's so, maybe that's it, you know, when I, when I get to watch that, that, the, those connections happen, it's, I mean, what's better? And it's happening over wine. I mean, it's the best. <laughs> Love it. So the last question is, what color is your feminine energy? And I've heard every color blue. from black to magenta. Oh, which blue. shade of blue? For me, I mean, I, I really like navy like a dark navy Mm -hmm. yeah a dark navy can be very elegant i love it very much Mm -hmm. well everyone thank you for listening i'm sure you want to hear more of Lee's stories stories of the amazing women that she has found and promoted around the world and i'm sure you want to taste their wine so don't don't be a stranger go follow her check out the website join the club whatever feels good to you And as I always like to say, you know, the world needs more love. Maybe, you know what, (laughs) kick up your heels, open a bottle of wine and enjoy your friends one night and just enjoy the moment because it's really about love, love for yourself and love for those around you. So Mm Marilee, as we wrap up today, what last message would you like to share with our audience? I guess (laughs) the way I'd wrap up is to say that here at Iola Wines and you know what guides me all Mm -hmm. the time is is actually our theme line bold women make the best wine naturally (laughs) love it yeah so and if people want to find me the website is is iolawines.com and and I'm on Instagram more than any other social media I'm on Instagram at iola.wines awesome I love it. And you're starting a YouTube channel, right? So we can go listen yeah. about wine. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's We've got it going. There's a handful of episodes up there. They're all live tasting. Some of are me with a different producers of ours, the ones that speak English. And then some are with a great wine friend of mine on the East Coast. And we get together and taste wines. All the wines are Iola wines. And we talk about food pairings and mm. do we go deep on, you know, a little bit of education, like like what we talked about with Bordeaux just yeah. earlier with, you know, right today. Well, we do a bit of that and then taste the wine too. So yeah, YouTube, definitely. 
Awesome. I love it. And by the way, don't forget the Vixen Voices on YouTube too. So you can listen to us on Apple, Spotify, or you could watch us on YouTube if you're not seeing these beautiful maps behind Mira Lee because you're listening on an app. So Mira Lee, this has been so fun. When I'm on the West Coast, I hope we can get together uh, face to face over a glass of wine and yeah. have more fun conversations. But thank you for joining us today, sharing your stories. And it's just so beautiful to see the way you glow and your enthusiasm for what you do. I, I love it. I always say there's nothing more beautiful than a woman on purpose and passion, right? On fire. So thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you so much, April. This has been amazing. I'm, I love what you're doing and it's a real privilege to be here. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Bye everyone. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks again for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to hit subscribe so future episodes are automatically downloaded directly to your device. And if you want access to today's show notes, including links to all the resources we mentioned, visit vixengathering.com slash podcast. Thanks again for listening, and I'll catch you next week for another episode of The Vixen Voice.